world, the ultimate visual history. Um, many of you have this book either en route to you right now or in your hands. I encourage you to flip through it um, as we enter today's festivities. So um, this stunning, stunning book is a definitive and very thorough account of the Jurassic World trilogy, which I assume all of you are very well versed in. Um, it's chock full of never before seen imagery and rare and exclusive interviews with key creatives from the series. It's a must have collectible for fans of the Jurassic, both, both uh, film series, Park and World. Um, I am thrilled today to present both the author of this book, James Matram. James, if you want to wave, go ahead. Right. In conversation with Glenn McIntosh, a paleo artist and animator who has worked on numerous Jurassic Park and World films. This conversation will be moderated by the wonderful Derek Davis, who is a contributing writer at Jurassic Outpost and the creator of Jurassic Time. Today's conversation is going to open up to a Q&A. I gathered from my exchanges with several of you that you have tons of questions that you would like to ask both James and Glenn. So if you do have questions, I encourage you to do so, um, to submit them in the right-hand panel there. You'll see a button with a question mark in it. Um, go ahead and pop your questions in that section. I'd love for y'all to really get into the chat um, and keep that a bit separate so the questions don't get lost, but feel free to connect with your fellow Jurassic enthusiasts in the chat on, uh, throughout the entire conversation. Um, after that Q&A, we're going to jump into a really quick giveaway of some amazing Insight Editions Jurassic theme products. And the event will be recorded. So um, if you have to hop out or if you have a friend that you want to share it with, I'll be sharing the recording link after. All right, everyone, thank you so, so much. Let's get those questions going. And Derek, I'm going to hand it off to you. All righty then. <laughs> so, I mean, the two of you, James and Glenn, obviously you have a connection with the world of dinosaurs and the world of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World that has connected with your perspective careers. It's like, what is it about the world of Jurassic and the world of dinosaurs? that excites both of you. I guess we'll start with Glenn's first since he has the most direct connection with, with this world. Uh, well, well, thank you for, uh, for, the, for the question and thank you so much for inviting me and letting me be a part of this. It's, it's a great honor to be a part of uh, James's book. Uh, I, and I know that for me, it, I, I grew up in uh, Calgary, Canada, which is very close to Drumheller, Canada, which is where they have the Terrell, Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology which is where a lot of the bones that you see in uh, all of the museums around, around uh, the world are replicas of bones that are found in that, that, that valley, that Red Deer River Valley in Montana and that whole area. Uh, and uh, so for me, it was going there when I was very young and I had a, a great fascination with them because they, to me, felt like sort of like the real version of the Ray Harryhausen monsters uh, that came to life. And so I always loved drawing, so I would always uh, draw whatever I saw and I liked when I got home. So uh, drawing and uh, love of dinosaurs sort of combined the two loves into animation. No, that's that's great. I mean, so much work and passion has to go into it to get like the designs as accurate as possible to dinosaurs at the time of you creating them. Because as we all probably know, dinosaurs can evolve over time in terms of new discoveries and new findings. So, I mean, look at Spinosaurus, for example. I mean, that guy's had a whole right. life after death. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, its design change has just gone through so many iterations, and I, I don't think anyone has still ar arrived on a definitive uh, uh, look. Like, I know that uh, Dr. Donald Henderson, who's the one of the curators of the Royal Terrell, still has uh, puts out papers and has debates about you know what what the exact use of the the sail was and the tail and uh, how it, how it potentially could have walked whether it was a biped or a quadruped so there's uh, like as these it's what's been so amazing is the evolution of these movies in the past thirty years we've just we've learned so much uh, so it'll be it's it's amazing to see like just how much more we're going to learn in the next uh, thirty years. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, uh, James, how about for you, like the world of Jurassic, like how is it, you know, connected with you during your time that you've written two books now? 
Yeah, I've, yeah, it's true. I sort of wrote these books, uh, the Jurassic Park Ultimate Visual History and the Jurassic World one, kind of simultaneously, or at least I researched them simultaneously. I was sort of doing interviews all through the kind of lockdown period. Um, and I was just kind of reaching here, there and everywhere. And, uh, you know, your respect for these films just grows and grows and grows when you do a book or books like these. Uh, I mean, you know, you just have to look back at Jurassic Park. That is such a watershed moment in cinema, in the history of cinema. I mean, obviously, with the sort of ushering in the digital revolution in terms of sort of visual effects, it's just it's such an incredible piece of work and, rem and remains that way. And yet I think what I really fell in love with writing these books is is the. Uh, the enthusiasm of fans it's you can only really compare it to to star wars fans in terms of their enthusiasm and an obsession and and just love and sort of deep love for for these and 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 really it's it's six movies so it's a much smaller range of 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 movies than than the star wars sort of franchise and each one has evolved and taken the franchise in a new direction i absolutely loved what Colin did on on Jurassic World, you know, basically did what we all wanted to see, which was the park finally open. And and yet he's you know uh, he steered it along with many other people, of course, in a you know in another direction. Sort of obviously with Dominion bringing them on onto well even in Fallen Kingdom bringing them onto the and onto the mainland, and even now with something like Camp, Camp Cretaceous taking it again in a different direction. And even with the, the the new one that's coming out in November, I think Hidden Hidden Adventure, the sort of yeah. choose your own adventure path. I mean, they just keep reinventing it, and and in quite fresh and interesting ways. So, yeah, that's just some of the things that I love about it. Yeah, no, it's I mean, especially to have that kind of like drive to go into you know amassing six movies worth of details. I mean, that's a lot to organize. It's just so much information from different people, I imagine, different people, different stories. Um, so, I mean, like what kind of, you know, for James, like what kind of um, organization do you have to do to keep track of all of this? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I, it, it, it was difficult, but, you know, the more you get into it, the more you do become organized in your head. I we have a, I'm, I live in London and we have a very good um, uh, film library here, the, the British Film Institute. So I I went in there and dug into as many articles as possible. I should uh, I mean this is you know referenced in both books, well particularly the the first book. But I have to pay you know due due credit to sort of Jody Duncan's Jody Duncan's making of books were absolutely masterful never, never mind that they're about jurassic they're among some of the best making of books i've ever read about any movie so detailed and jody's articles at cinefx as well were absolutely invaluable i have to say also derek this is entirely true i use the jurassic outpost site quite a lot as well <laughs> pa partly because you had all of the um scripts for the early movies uploaded which were, again was absolutely invaluable to me and then it's you know meeting people like like glenn you know you get certain people who are absolutely breakthrough people who i mean glenn and i spent about two hours uh, on the phone or zoom i can't remember but it, you know we just talked and talked or rather glenn talks because he just has so many wonderful <laughs> recollections and it, and it's people like that. I mean, another one for me was David Vickery uh, when I was doing the new book, who obviously is the visual uh, effects supervisor. He he knows so much about the Jurassic universe. Colin Trevorrow, obviously, I had a number of sessions with him. It, Bryce Dallas Howard was amazing. You know, there are so many people that just build up your knowledge bit by bit, basically. And it, it's like putting a giant jigsaw together and trying to keep it all on your head is very difficult. <laughs> God, yeah, I can, I can only imagine. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, so, Glenn, you're, um, you know, you obviously love dinosaurs, as we can see right behind you. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so you were actually um, working on Jurassic Park Three. Was your first foray into the Jurassic films? Am I correct? It was. I had always had a love of dinosaurs, uh, but when I was at Industrial Light and Magic, they started doing uh, animation test developments for uh, Jurassic Park 3, 
And I was supposed to go on to be like a storyboard artist for Attack of the Clones. And uh, Dan Taylor, who was the animation supervisor for Jurassic Park 3, he would sat near me. And so I've all loved dinosaurs ever since I was a little kid. So I would sort of like bring books into him or like, you know, like, oh, have you seen this book? Or, you know, have you knew, did you know, have you heard about this recent discovery? And it wasn't like trying to get the gig because I was already on Star Wars. But uh, finally he went to management and he's just like, look, can I get this guy as one of my lead animators? Because like, he seems super enthusiastic about it. And, and I was like, sure, like I, uh, that'd be great. So that was uh, so it was great because I already had a love uh, for it, and uh, so to be able to like to you, you know to transition onto it was like super easy because it was just it was so much fun. And then to become the uh, the raptor lead, and then so then you specifically hone in on that type of movement, and then they'd be like, oh well, no one's animating the big fight between the spino and the T Rex. Do you want to do that? And you're like got three weeks to go, and you're like, ah. Uh, but you can't. It's something you can. You cannot say no to as an animator, and so you. Uh, and plus, I had the opportunity to work with uh, so many talented artists like uh, Joe Johnston, who you know directed Captain America and uh, the Rocketeer, and and uh, of course designed all of the amazing spaceships in in uh, the Star Wars movies. So it was a, and a great opportunity to work with him as well. So uh, all around, it was just like a, uh, okay. This is, you know, we're not going to get much sleep for the next few weeks, but it was, uh, it was the sort of thing that you, you, you couldn't say no to. Well, yeah, I mean, especially when you got the call 14 years later, right, for Jurassic World. I mean, that's such a, yeah. a huge gap. I mean, was that exciting for you to go back into that world or, like, oh, unexpected? So, <laughs> so exciting. Well, it, it was always sort of uh, uh, people talked about it and uh, suspected that it would be something that, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg would potentially be interested in, you know, tipping his uh, uh, toe back into. Uh, and we were always wondering, you know, is this ever going to, is this ever going to happen again? And we all just kind of like, well, we'll see, maybe someday, fingers crossed. And then it actually started to gain momentum. And then uh, uh, as far as from a script point of view, and then everyone started talking about uh, Colin Trevorrow's uh, first film, Safety Not Guaranteed. And how he is uh, friends with J.J. Abrams, and J.J. Abrams uh, was being courted to uh, direct uh, the Jurassic movie. You know, where people try and uh, in in Hollywood, it's it's essentially just people trying to figure out each other's schedules. You know, like, well, I can't do it this, you know, for, for the next few months because I'm working on this movie, but I could do it in this section, but then I can't do it in this section. And you realize it's just a big, like, jumbling of uh, of pieces of trying to fit the right people into the right slot at the right time. And so he couldn't do it, but he suggested Colin Trevorrow. And Colin came into it with just an enthusiasm uh, that uh, I think really impressed uh, Stephen and uh, with his take on it. And, and it was only his second movie. And uh, he uh, and so me being so enthusiastic about dinosaurs, you know, I brought my enthusiasm, enthusiasm to it. So um, we obviously had the opportunity to learn from the, the old masters that had taken us to the original Jurassic. So. We always had Dennis Mirren and Phil Tippett just kind of looking over and Frank Marshall just kind of looking over our shoulders, just like, you know, what are they up to and making sure that we didn't do anything too crazy. But we were uh, we always wanted to uh, be reverential of not only those stories, but the style of movement that that Phil and, and his team had created uh, for the uh, the Jurassic films. And um, uh, as, as far as, you know, making them feel like big, huge animals and uh that meant doing a lot of research and a lot of studying for the, the animation team. Yeah. Cause if you don't have dinosaurs, you don't have a movie and you got to get them right. Or people will go. Yeah. Knives and pitchforks on the internet. <laughs> 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 Be careful. Um, but no, that's, that's great though. I mean, and especially like people love, I mean, going back to JP three, just for a second, like people love, um, you know, the Velociraptors, especially in Jurassic Park 3, just the way they were designed yeah. and the way yeah. know, they interacted and everything. It's just amazing. And I, I agree. <laughs> but of course, yeah, you know, and, and like with, with the round pupil and the quills, like they were moving more and more towards like bird type styles. So I wanted to incorporate bird type movements uh, into their into their uh, head ticks and the way they would like uh, turn and look at something or just get more. And then talking to Jack Horner. 
you know, you're talking to one of the top paleontologists in the world, and he was just kept saying, you know, hammering into my head, you know, think bird, 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 bird. <laughs> and so anytime we uh, focused on a particular scene, we would, you know, I would have the animators call up a scene from YouTube of a blue heron hunting a gopher or uh, an eagle, you know, walking the way it ambled or uh, the way a, a hawk would like turn and, and look at its prey and, and just all those little moments that you're trying to get from the natural world into the animation to make it feel like, oh, I've seen that on an animal before. And that's a good thing. Like it made the audience realize like that reminds me of a crow or a hawk or an elephant or something I saw, you know, so that it feels more real uh, to you. And you're not ex exactly sure why, but that's why that was sort of the, always the main goal where I would show that to Dennis and Phil and they'd be like, try and put a little bit more elephant into this shot or a little bit more lion into this shot, you know, just anything that pulls something that we would never see in the real world in our time, obviously into our world. We're like, Oh, that reminds me of something I've seen at the zoo. And then it, uh, it just felt like a real animal. And so, uh, uh, doing that was a lot of fun and very rewarding. Yeah. And it shows on the screen, just like the extra realism. I mean, you know, in Jurassic world, the Raptors especially are kind of the stars of that movie, you know, the Raptor squad, you know, in right. Jurassic world. <laughs> so <Right? laughs> it was great to see them, you know, fully realized, you know, or continue to be fully realized. Yeah. You know, as every movie and, and, it was, and it was also fun. Like we didn't know how much animatronics were going to be used we didn't know how much the cg was going to be used so it was sort of a because jurassic park 3 didn't perform as well as the first jurassic park movie obviously so it was kind of a question mark like it wasn't like a known like the marvel movies where it's like okay this movie's gonna make a billion dollars people were very unsure about, about jurassic park 3 um so you know you but you're sort of like you know trying to embellish on that mythology and make it bigger and better but with a lot of that work, you're, um, yeah, you're trying to to do things that you've uh, make the animal, you know, just make that world richer and make that world bigger and and make uh, um, people, you know, like see that the the dinosaurs in in, in, a, in like exactly like uh, Alan Grant says, more like animals, not monsters. Uh, but uh, as far as the animatronics goes, I would always fight to be there on set where I'd be holding the styrofoam head that was representative of the Raptor instead of just being on a sea stand that they would lock into place. And they were like, well, you know, what do you get out of that? And I'm like, well, I don't get anything out of it. I'll animate, I could animate it going wherever, but if it's just locked there, it doesn't give the actor anything. Meaning that with Chris Pratt was, you know, three feet away from a Bengal tiger and he had to take something off of its head and he didn't know if it was going to, snuggle him or rip his arm off you'd be scared out of your mind so some so between each take i would pull back or i would dart towards him and he didn't know what i was going to do so he would do these little movements uh in his acting which was great because then we could then put that into the animation so he gives us something and then we could give him something back so that it feels like it's more there um and uh then that really helped so def, def def definitely helping so yeah, for sure. See, I, I love those kind of stories. That's stuff that, you know, people don't know unless they were there that that's how they happen. And, you know, uh, James, was there any stories that you were told, you know, for the book that, you know, just couldn't make the cut? Because, you know, books can only be so long, can't be a thousand pages. So yeah, like, was there anything yeah. you were told that yeah. had to be cut? <laughs> well, I thought you were about to ask what was my favorite anecdote from the book. And I'll just tell you that before we get into that question, but okay. only because it's Glenn related and it's... um. Uh, from Fallen, <laughs> Fallen Kingdom, where, you know, in a way, Glenn, you're as much as an actor as some of, you know, some of those credited on the film. I mean, when you were, you were being the Baryonyx, basically, in that, in that tunnel scene, yeah. you were dressed in a unitard, which I think is just a, a delightful yeah. image, basically. Um, so, those are yeah. very unforgiving. <laughs> if you haven't been on the Stairmaster, those were very unforgiving. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. But so that was one of my favorite anecdotes. Glenn, Glenn being part of that, you know, really taking a part of that baryonyx and you know becoming that. Yeah, in terms of stories that didn't make it, um, I, I know that people wanted to know about the Iris death scene that was filmed, and I did talk to people about that and. The problem with these books is you you need good material to back up your 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 narrative, let's say, and there just wasn't enough, as well as there wasn't the room for it. There just wasn't enough 
uh, strong material to really talk about that. I did talk to J.A. Bayona about it a little bit, but it, what I got out of him just wasn't really enough to, to include it in the book. Uh, I wish I could sort of give you all a great juicy anecdote about it. Um, I followed up on with Derek Connolly about these sort of rumours about um, Ian Malcolm supposedly being more included in the, uh, you know, in the original drafts. And he didn't really remember anything about that. So uh, now that's not to say there wasn't a version somewhere, but um, yeah, he, he had no recollection of it. Obviously, the problem is you're going back, in, well, in this case, what was it, sort of seven, eight years ago, I suppose, nine years ago, whenever they were writing the script for Fallen Kingdom. So people's memories can be fuzzy sometimes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so there, there were a few things that you, you would love to have included. But again, a lot of it is down to space. I mean, both books I wrote, I think both books run to about 75, 76,000 words, and both were, were longer and got cut down just because of, you know, um, just space, basically, which is heartbreaking, obviously. But uh, and, and, you, and you want to sort of give everyone, you know, uh, some sort of, I mean, my favorite Jurassic, I mean, you guys all know this, obviously, but um, the 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 thing that's in um, the, the that's playing on Nedry's monitor in the control room, you know, the film that's playing in the background, which can barely be seen, obviously, is Jaws. I mean, most people, like most super fans, know that. But I just love that detail, and I really wanted to get that in the book. But it just didn't really fit in the narrative, and you, and it just has to go. Right. So your your favorite moments right. kind of have to kind of have to go, which is it's very annoying, but. You know, you have to really serve the story of how they made these films, first of all. Yeah, and then that was part of the one. Yeah, the, I was like, I was like, when we were on set, and the you know the the, the the island is supposed to be exploding, and they've got lava dripping from the ceiling, and it turns out that uh, kitty litter uh, on fire looks great on film. <laughs> An another so, like, good anecdote, that kitty litter house. anecdote. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. So that's like this kitty litter pouring, flaming kitty litter pouring down from the ceiling, which was hilarious. But it looks amazing on film. But the uh, uh, the stuntman was I, Barry Onyx had to grab this guy's pant leg and pull him back down, and it's like he was waiting for me to do it. And I said, "No, you just got to go. I'll I'll just grab you." And he had he had on these big hiking boots, and he you know he kicked my hand, and on like the sixth take. Uh, and and the uh, second assistant, the second unit director is like, I think we, uh, I think we got it. And they go, Yeah, I think we did too. <laughs> like, I don't want to do a seventh. This uh, that hurt. But uh, but it looked, it, it just you, those little moments where you're like, Nah, it can be better. We can. We want it to look like he's really trying to get out of there, and it, this thing's really snagging his pants. Like you don't want to shortchange the audience, and so you're you're doing all these things. Later, later that night at the hotel, you're like. Yeah, that, that kind of hurt, <laughs> but uh, it's it's in the movie, so it's uh, that's is worth it. Yeah, people at home, do not try blaming K Kitty Litter at home, please, <laughs> please. We'd want to hear no. these reports. Yeah, no, no, they were they were surrounded by uh, like like dozens of professionals with a fire team at every exit telling us what we we shouldn't be doing, and and that was number one on the list. So it was good to be. Uh, around the, those people that knew exactly what they were doing, and I'm uh, and and telling me exactly where to stand because uh, otherwise uh, there could have been some problems. But they were so good at what they did, and it was such a safe set. Even though there's so many events in the movie that don't look safe, so we would have constant safety meetings about where you need to stand and and uh, and so forth. Which was uh, I I never never felt uh, uh, in danger. It was just always uh, fun to see everyone trying to do their best. Well, yeah, I mean, safety has to be guaranteed in this case, right? <laughs> Very yeah. good. Well yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see we're amassing some, some questions. So I think we'll go to some of our uh, viewer questions. Um, let's see, the very first one is from Justin Peterson. And he says, what was the most surprising anecdote or fact uncovered when researching writing this book? And I think, James, you kind of already answered that a little bit. But if you want to elaborate even more. Do you mean the one regarding uh, what the, the, Nedry, uh, the Nedry Jaws thing, you mean, or something else? Yeah, um, just, or something hmm. else, yeah. 
what else did I find that was surprising? Um, God, there was so much, really. Um, I'll come back to that if I can think of something. Okay. <laughs> Got you guys. All right. So the second question, the meantime, is from Josh Rasick. And he says, it was mentioned in the book that the Biosyn Amber Mines contained 90 style Biosyn logos, but unfortunately can't be seen in the film itself. Do you have any further information on where we can see these? I'm really intrigued by the environmental storytelling. I agree with him. Yeah, <laughs> I that, want to see that's, those uh, that's a really good point, actually. Um, because I actually re rewatched Dominion last night and I was just sort of but didn't notice at the time that, yeah, those logos are just not to be seen. But that's the nature of being a production designer. Yeah, that was Kevin Jenkins, wasn't it? That sort of told me that uh, long anecdote about that. But, you, you know, you can you can design all this stuff and it just is in the background and doesn't really end up on on film. Uh, yeah, it would be great to see uh, more of that. I mean, I the one element that surprised me in dominion was sort of having read a version of the script uh probably uh, well, over a year ago now and the dilophosaurus scene where the dilophosaurus is attack claire um and i checked this last night when i was sort of re-watching it um in the script the and this is mentioned i think in the book that the the venom is supposed to be caught by kayla in her glove and you see in the in the resulting film her kind of throwing her glove off but what you see is chris pratt's character strangling the distant officerus and then they they kind of dispatch with it there but so you don't really see the the catching of the venom so maybe they just decided to cut it out but that you know that was like a lovely moment i i thought that would have been great in the film but i guess they decided not to go with it yeah, and I mean, things are going to be cut just like in the book itself. So, I mean, you know, I guess they're trying to up the, you know, the pacing of the scene or the pacing of the action. So, I mean, unfortunately, cool details like that and, and like the logo, um, unfortunately, have to get cut. I mean, did you actually see the logo ever or you were just told about it? I was just told about it. I, I never saw I any uh, artwork for it, um, as I remember. So... Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, as I say, it's probably one of those. If you go back to the set, it will most certainly be there. Well, obviously the set will have been struck now, but um, yeah, it's a shame because that's that's the nature of production designers' work. Like I said, you see so little of it on screen, or it, it flashes past in a second. Yeah, but it's it's just still nice to know that those details existed, right? Yeah. Just to know that it was that fleshed out, which is why. You know, artists, you know, like Glenn are so important to, mm. you know, create the world and create the characters, you know. Oh, I so remembered cool. an answer to your oh. the, pre the previous question, by the way, a surprising detail. Well, just the detail I absolutely loved. And it's it's totally visible in, in Dominion, where you have this um, kind of gar biosyn garden that you see a few, few scenes in. And of course, that's where the final battle takes place. And where the T-Rex walks past the circle, this sort of giant uh circle that's just you know in the middle of the in the garden and of course it effectively recreates the jurassic logo and that's obviously been done deliberately and i just thought that was such a cool detail when i heard i, I heard that way before of course i saw the film and uh i think it was david vickery that told me that and i just thought oh that's such a cool idea and it i think that's what so they cool. don't do in the film is that is the dinosaur keeps moving it doesn't stop in the middle of the circle which is kind of what i imagined it to do but uh it, it still was such a beautiful idea and just kind of sums up the artistry going on that's a that's a a one second moment in the film and yet would take you know uh probably weeks to set up i would imagine <laughs> No, that's great. I know I'm that kinda... the uh, yeah, one of the sketches that I had done for the uh, the petting zoo was the uh, the idea that just just coming up with different like what what animals would you see in the petting zoo? What did what dinosaurs would be really good in a petting zoo, and what ones would be potential lawsuit disaster? And so we had come with these like uh, uh, baby ceratopsians that you could ride, and um, I had done this one quick little sketch where. The little boy is feeding it an ice cream cone, and right behind them is this big sign that says, "You know, please do not feed us human food. Uh, we, we, we got, we already get our dino food, or something like that." But just sort of like, um, in a, 
sort of going back to the general thesis of, of Jurassic uh, Park is just like nature's get along, going to get along just fine without us. Don't, you know, don't. And just the constant mistakes that humans are making. Little boy isn't trying to be bad by feeding the ice cream to the Triceratops, but it's just another example of like goofing up again. He's not supposed to be giving ice cream to this dinosaur. And then when I was on the set at the elephant enclosure in Honolulu, our first day, and they had moved the elephants um, into the behind behind the enclosure there, so that we all the extras could be out there, and that was going to be the pteranodon petting zoo area where the pteranodons attack. And there was this sign: "Please do not feed us human f- food." And I was like, I thought that was so cool that someone had seen that and made that into a real sign. This this little idea I had 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 made it into the movie, which was really Love really that really rewarding. And really, really, really fun. So, the other thing that was interesting was that uh, uh, the elephants are such sensitive animals. What well, that the elephants had been sort of you know herded over into the corner, and now the pteranodons were supposed to be attacking and running around and grabbing people and flying away and swooping down. And so we had like two hundred extras running around in complete silence. And Colin's like, "Cut, uh, guys." You know, they're they're trying to. The assistant director's like, guys, they're they're swooping down. They're trying to kill you. They're they're these things are trying. They're kamikaze dive bombing you, and they're attacking your children. They're out to get you. Let's go again and action. And everyone starts screaming. They're just like crazy. And of of course, we hear <laughs> the elephants start going nuts. And the manager comes running over to us, and he's like, you can't be doing that. Like elephants are incredibly sensitive animals. They can tell when something is in is in anguish or in pain, and they just didn't like the fact that they that they thought hum, uh, humans were in trouble. So it was it was so interesting to see that these elephants were like like felt sorry for all these uh, extras. <laughs> Glenn, I didn't even know that anecdote. You see, that would have gone in the book if I'd known that before. So that, oh, that's, that's, that's a really good one. That's an exclusive right now. <laughs> That's why people tune in now. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. And now there's actually, the next question is directed toward Glenn. Um, and it's from Colleen Lindsay. And she says, Glenn, how much input did you have in the design of the newer dinosaurs, the, the genetically designed ones, like the hybrids? Uh, qu- quite more than I, uh, than I thought, which was fantastic. Because uh, I like to be involved as, as, as soon as possible because form follows function. And so uh, I didn't want to get a design and then felt be held to like one piece of artwork and then, okay, now make it move like this. And, but the limbs are the incorrect length or, uh, or, or so forth and, and so forth. And so being uh, involved that early, especially with Indominus Rex, like designing the new, di- the new bad dinosaur was so much fun. Uh, and I just... Uh, I said, is it okay if I do some sketches? And with my background in storyboarding, feature design, Colin was like, sure. And uh, I noticed that a lot of the designs, if if T-Rex's head is sort of sloped this way, we we could go for something more like this. If it's supposed to be white, and the T-Rex is supposed to be sort of an opaque, you know, uh, an all uh, olive drab color, uh, shape wise, you've got to be able to take those two silhouettes and put them back to back, and with the amount of cutting there is in film now, it got immediately be able to look at those two dinosaurs and go, I know who is who. Like, you know, this is the good din- dinos- good dinosaur, this is the T-Rex. And so I was like looking at a lot of abelosaurs, uh, like, like Majungasaurus and Rugops and uh, um, uh, Carn- Carn- Carnotosaurus, like just to sort of like get a different structure and a different texture to the, the, the dinosaur so that uh, as much as possible when they start fighting, it's just, not just some big motion blurry mess that you could tell who who was who. That was that was really important to me. So uh, what's so exciting and what I was so thrilled about when I saw James's book is that how much of that process he's put into uh, the book and how many of my sketches made it in, uh, which is just uh, I've always I've had sketches and art of books before, but not, not, never to, to this level. And 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 that's all thanks to James because um, and it was just it was so much fun to see because. You always go into these movies just, you know, that's that's your job. You do 200, 300 sketches, and if 200 or 300 get rejected, oh, well, you 
that's that's your job. But uh, so so to see the designs in the new book is is really a treat. Well, so Derek, I mean, as you sort of already noted, I mean, Glenn goes right back to Jurassic Park three. He he bridges the two franchises. I mean, even in Dominion, you were involved with that uh, the, the sort of prologue that went on the internet and is now back in the extended edition. Which I mean, just from a personal point of view, I think is one of the most beautiful sequences in any Jurassic movie because it it's very very different to what we've seen in all the others. I mean, of course, it's supposed to be sixty five million years ago. It is you know one you know the way they film it in in you know in that uh, that uh, island Socotra was incredible. I mean, I'm just curious how you felt seeing yeah. that sequence put together. Well, it, it was it was. It, I was so thankful to be uh, res get that offer from Colin. You know, would you like to storyboard the opening sequence? And he had talked about Rite of Spring from Fantasia. And I'm just a Stanley Kubrick uh, nut. Like, if we just pan around, there's I've got all these Stanley Kubrick books. Uh, and I loved the opening of uh, 2001, where the Dawn of Man sequence, where it was just 17 minutes of just silence because that's all the earth was for 500 million years as earth, you know, as life was starting to come on land from the ocean and uh, no car horns, no music, no, just absolute silence, except the sounds of nature. And uh, if you took a BBC documentary crew back in time, like what would they see? Uh, and I just looked at the Dawn of Man sequence and uh, took inspiration from that of uh uh, you're gradually being introduced to this world of, of, of the dinosaurs waking up. And to James's point, they filmed on the island of Socotra, which I already already had a primordial quality to it. And so I did a lot of Google searches for the, the look they wanted. Um, but of course, my cut came in at, at around, I, I wanted as few cuts as possible and like really long lenses, like a documentary crew is trying to film these things from two miles away. And it came in at like 15 minutes and Colin was like, you're killing me. <laughs> like, It's supposed to be a modern day blockbuster. <laughs> you know, you're going to have kids looking on their phones and heading for popcorn after three minutes. And so it was uh, uh, going back to, a, to an older style of, uh, where uh, just like longer cuts and just letting the audience enjoy this time uh, before we get into the action. And it was so much fun to play around with that. And then, send notes to him and then I'd get feedback from him. And he goes, well, why, why are these two shots? Why don't we make it one shot? And I'm like, why don't we? This is, that's awesome. You know, so it was, uh, that was a real treat to do. But that sequence is so important to set up the entire T-Rex versus Giganotosaurus battle, really. I mean, it, I don't know what you thought, Derek, whether you feel it, it works much better having it back in the, in the movie. Oh, totally. I mean, it was, oh. I, know, I know it wasn't Colin's idea to cut it, but it was, it was wrong of Universal to cut it, basically, because um, like you said, it does set up a battle <laughs> and it, it really just, you know, and the drive in sequence, too, as one of my favorites, because I saw Jurassic Park in the drive in the first time I saw it as a kid. <laughs> they were cl clinging on to existence at the time in the early 90s. Um, <laughs> so like seeing that drive in sequence was kind of like, um, you know, a full circle for me. So it was like, oh, but thank God the extended cut brings it all back in. That's, yeah. in my opinion, the only way to watch yeah. the film at this point. So. And what, what a double bill, Flash Gordon oh. and American Graffiti that was yeah. supposed to be playing at that uh, drive-in. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of really funny Easter eggs in, in that prologue, so. <clears throat> yeah, I love it. Um, now this question's uh, to James from Colleen Lindsay again. Uh, James, what was something that surprised you about the production of either Jurassic World or Jurassic Park when you were doing research? Wow. Uh, wow. I think with Jurassic Park, it's just the <laughs> insane efforts they went to, to, to you know, I mean, they, to, to create these digital dinosaurs. I mean, I, I was talking earlier about breakthrough people that, that you speak to, you know, when you're along the way, when you're researching this. And in the case of Jurassic Park, I'd spoken quite early to Dennis Buren and Phil Tippett, who are obviously complete legends, and they were great, and they give you a certain perspective. But then much, much later in the process, having already written at least two drafts, I kind of got in touch with a lot of, uh, I mean, people that Glenn will know, of course, um, Mark DePay, uh, Steve Spaz-Williams, uh, Stefan yeah. Fangmeyer, all those guys who, who were so important in the kind of, you know, digital revolution, let's say, 
and th th they were the ones that, that opened my eyes to a, to different stories and how, about how Jurassic Park got made. I mean, there's always different stories that people have different perspectives. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the, the sort of secret nights that, that Steve and Mark spent creating these sort of skeletal digital, uh, you know, T-Rexes that were then eventually shown to Kathy Kennedy when she kind of popped around the office one day. And, you know, it's just things like that. You think, well, if those guys hadn't had that initiative to do that, maybe we wouldn't have, um, well, the digital revolution would have come eventually, obviously, but uh, it may not have come through Jur the Jurassic series anyway. Yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> Let's see, uh, to both Glenn and James, what were your favorite aspects of the park and world aesthetics? And this is from, probably going to say his name wrong, I'm sorry, um, Muzamil Sheik. There you go. Uh, go ahead, James. Yeah, well, I, uh, in terms of the aesthetics, well, I quite like the way you've got, uh, I mean, the, the, the park design, you know, being the sort of yellow, green, sort of safari print, if we're talking about things like that, and then the way it translated to a steel blue gray color in in Jurassic World, much more corporate and business like in a way. Yeah, um, yeah. Compared to the Hammond, the Hammond coloring, which was m more like those theme parks you probably all remember from the nineties, I guess. Um, although uh, the ones we had in the UK were pretty lame, so <laughs> we wouldn't have had anything like that. But. Um, yeah, I kind of really like that. That you know, the the whole point of Collins series is the sort of uh, corporate corporatization, if that's a word, um, of, of you know, obviously they're turning it into a huge uh, con conglomerate kind of business, and those that coloring just seemed to suit that kind of universe so well. So I think they really very cleverly looked at, uh, at how these kind of corporations you know build these theme parks and and run these theme parks in uh in, in modern day so yeah that, those i thought those were kind of interesting just to sort of the colors the textures i thought were you know it's not it's not it's not anything overt but it's something that's in the back of your mind that you think yeah that's a very clever artistic decision that colin and all his sort of art direction team you know um sort of ed vero it was and, and obviously rick carter helped out a little bit on on jurassic world and all those i mean those guys again they span much like glenn they spanned the two franchises and that's so vital to have that kind of connection across the two series and i love the uh, uh the, it's the little uh, easter eggs that they put along main street like jimmy buffett's margaritaville and they actually got jimmy buffett in the shot carrying the margaritas as they're being attacked by the dimorphodons which i thought was hilarious but um the uh the that steakhouse that's on the corner that the dimorphodons crash into that's winston's steakhouse uh, it's giving a little credit to Stan Winston. But then when you went over to the T-Rex enclosure, like if you go around this corner, you'll be entering the T-Rex the uh, uh, paddock. And they had all these warnings uh, of, of things, uh, you know, to do or not do if you're going to enter the pad, like going on a roller coaster. And I don't know if it made it in, into uh, James's book or if it made it into the movie, but I loved all the little things like, you know, if you have a weak heart, you know, like seeing a T-Rex, that's, you know, going to be, that's going to scare the hell out of you. So, or, uh, or have you gone to the bathroom before you see the T-Rex? So little <laughs> things like that, that just, uh, how much of them were in jokes and how much of them were Easter eggs? I don't know, but I love that attention to detail. Uh, and like I said about like the, uh, you know, don't feed us uh, only uh, don't feed us human food. Uh, little 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 things like that they peppered all over uh, Main Street was just was just amazing and it made it fe feel for us like uh, like a completely real environment. So I think they even uh, invented an entire menu for for the Winston Steakhouse. It was one of one of the restaurants anyway. Had an entire menu, yeah. and you think again, that's the sort of stuff you're not really going to see on film, but right. it's just right. just that fantastic attention to detail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fully Absolutely. realized Jurassic World. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and speaking of Jurassic World again, um, another question from Muzumil Sheik. Uh, with the Jurassic World opened up, is there any location you would like to see the dinosaurs in the potential future? So I guess past Dominion. Ah, that's interesting. I was actually going to ask you guys uh, just as to how you see the franchise unfolding now. I wonder if it'll be like, the the star wars universe where they've obviously done 
TV shows, you know, The Mandalorian and so forth, um, where they can sort of search into these corners of um, of the Star Wars universe to find characters that aren't connected necessarily strictly to the Skywalker saga. And I wonder if they'll do something like that. I mean, I I would put money on there being, I have no evidence for this, by the way, but I'd put money on there being a Kayla Watts spin-off because uh, DeWonder Wise was obviously fantastic uh, in that role. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be cool just to see her, even if it's a prequel or something, seeing her flying dinosaurs back and forth? I'm sure she has some cool stories to tell. More, more, more information about that pet dino she has in the in the market, which is, you know, there's, there's lots of cool stuff you could do with Kayla. So I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it would be more character based. That's how I would see it happening. But I don't know. What do you think, Glenn? I, I agree. I, 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 there's a. You know, the, the Royal Terrell is in the middle of nowhere in Drumheller, uh, and they get 8,000 visitors a day. And their uh, their uh, attendance triples when a Jurassic movie comes out. The, 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 the curator told me that. So th there's not only a, a love of dinosaurs across the board culturally, but there's a love of these movies. And, and uh, that's, that's only... Uh, Gonna, gonna gonna expand you know like and i i i've had so many uh you know artists and animators and filmmakers come up to me and say oh i got into filmmaking because of jurassic park 3 or you know jurassic world or whatever but i've had just as many paleontologists come up and say that so that's so rewarding uh because i think people will always love dinosaurs because they occupy sort of that middle ground you, you see how popular uh, house of dragons is on hbo and you know they're uh, you know, they're essentially dinosaurs breathing fire, you know, but it's uh, the same same thing with the Hobbit films and Smaug. It's like there's a, a fascination we have with these gigantic lizards that absolutely we know absolutely roam this this world. And so uh, knowing more about them and, and uh, getting to know more about their world, is, uh, I think we'll always be wanting to tell those stories. Oh, yeah. And like you said, they're important not just to the screen, but beyond the screen for different, you know, places like zoos, museums and, you know, everything like that. So it's it's an important, you know, source of participation for everybody. Um, so it's, it's great that movies can tra tra transcend the screen like that. Um, now, we have another question from Justin Peterson. Uh, was there a dinosaur design or idea that didn't make it out of the concept phase that you were sad not to see in the movies? Oh, that I was sad not to see. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, well, this is me being super nerdy, but uh, no, no, no kidding. That's what we're here for. Uh, <laughs> that, that ship has sailed. So the, um, the, uh, the Mosasaur uh, was technically not uh, a dinosaur. It was a marine reptile. Um, and uh, it, it was a monitor lizard, and monitor, these, these mosasaurs got absolutely enormous. They got to, like, you know, 40 to 50 feet long. I mean, they're just absolutely gigantic creatures, and so when there's the sequence where it, it comes up and grabs the great white shark, uh, we showed it to Stephen, and Stephen was like, guys, it's a great white, you know, it, it's, it's a Jurassic Park movie. You got to make it bigger. Go bigger. Go bigger, and we're like, okay, so we made it a little bit bigger, and he's like, it's a Jurassic Park with you guys. You gotta go bigger. So we ended up scaling up that Mosasaur to like, if you actually, you know, scaled it out to the proper length that we scaled it out to, it was 120 feet long. <laughs> so it was about the size of a blue whale. So then we started looking at reference of, you know, saltwater crocodiles jumping out of the water to humpback whales jumping out of the water to, you know, they can, which they can do. They, you know, you know, 40 or 50 tons, they can do it. Um, so then there's teeth on the roof of uh, the Mosasaur's mouth. And so I asked them, went to the modeler. We put that in. That made it in. Not a problem. And then um, I went to Colin and I said, you know, technically they should have giant forked tongues. And I only know that because Jack Horner said, you know, there's a, a gland called the Cowper's gland. Uh, I'm sorry, not the Cowper's, the um, Jacobson's organ. Jacobson's organ. Uh, uh, pulls the uh, uh, it back and, and plugs it into uh, the, the tongue in to let it know whether there's blood in the water or whether there's uh, uh, blood in the air. And it says, we can absolutely, you know, uh, put that in. And so I went to Colin. I said, it should actually be like a, um, a forked tongue. 
And he goes, well, now we've scaled up our Moses sword to 120 feet. Now you want me to give it a forked tongue. So to, you know, 0.1% of the audience that watches that movie, they're going to go, oh, cool. They, they actually went to the trouble of making sure that it's a forked tongue. But most of the audience, I think, would have looked at it and went, um, that's, no, nah, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that a 120 foot long creature has a forked tongue like a, a giant dragon. So it's, uh, uh, that was one of those things that didn't make it in, but I understood why it didn't make it in because you're always walking that fine line. Whereas you want it to be a, a, a giant animal, uh, uh, in, in, that lives in nature and not a, a, a monster that lives as a creature of uh, fantasy. So Certain things that, that were let go, I, I, I totally understood why they were let go. I love that. I'm just looking at one of the comments, by the way, and, and Daniel Stephen has said he'd love to see a, an authentic adaptation, or proper, he used the word, proper adaptation of the Lost World book, which I sort of know what he means because it's. I love the book, The Lost World, and obviously the, the Spielberg version veers off quite significantly. I just love the portrayal of, of Lewis Dodgson in that. The, the He's completely sociopathic basically <laughs> obviously he's a little bit more softened in in what we get in the movies but uh, sadly i don't think that adaptation will ever happen um it's because obviously you'd be retreading a certain amount of spielberg and no one remakes spielberg <laughs> films right no no they better not <laughs> and i guess uh, amanda we're gonna do a giveaway right yes we are first i just have to say wow that was incredible. <laughs> what a cool experience to just have like nonstop nerding out about Jurassic Park and World <laughs> Tuesday morning for us. Um, wherever you are, you have this chunk in your day that uh, you know you don't always get midweek. So thank you all for joining us. Um, sorry we didn't get to all of your amazing questions, but thank you for contributing. This was just a joy. It's why we do what we do at Insight. Um, James, Glenn, Derek, as I said, leading up to this, your brains combined, just fantastic. Um, if that doesn't demonstrate the value of this book, I don't know what will. So um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of you, but you will be able to find most of those questions addressed in the book itself. Um, as for the giveaway, we have some really good products to share with y'all. I have some trivia questions that I suspect this will just be a who can type fast competition <laughs> based on the depth of knowledge that I've gleaned from these questions. So first up, this is going to be a bundle, but the first product we have is this amazing lock and key journal. It is protected right now in plastic wrap. It's a lock and key diary with two keys, which is great because I am keen to lose at least one. Um, and it has a um, invisible ink dinosaurs throughout with a light in the pen. So basically when you see a little icon, you can find the dinosaurs in the book. Um, this is a great uh, flex to just have on your work desk when you're taking notes uh, and you're getting distracted in a meeting. We also have a projector ballpoint pen. You can project a T-Rex. I wish I could demo it here, but I can't turn the lights off. Uh, or rather I can, I just, I, I, I don't want to invite that kind of trepidation into my Tuesday. Um, and you can project this onto a wall. It makes a huge T-Rex. Again, a really fun party trick that you can just bust out. and Just in time for Halloween. <laughs> exactly. And then we have an enamel charm bookmark. This is a really cool one. Our, our enamel bookmarks are great because they basically wrap around like a rubber band almost around the book. So you really don't have that slipping issue. Um, so yeah, all of these will go together in a bundle and there will be several lucky winners. I have a few trivia questions and how I'm going to pick the winner is I'll just whoever answers correctly, I'm just gonna randomly select you from that bunch. So the first one up is what does Indominus Rex mean? So brushing up on your Latin, let me know in the chat. Do any Indominus Right. <laughs> Derek's like, do I get to play? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> All right. Justin, you are right. It is Untamable King. And since well no one done, else Justin. got that, that is you are a guaranteed winner, Justin. Congrats. <laughs> maybe I did. Maybe I did get it, a tough it, question. Go me. Yeah, it went through All a right. lot of it went through a lot of names. So to get on that to get Indominus Untamable King, that's impressive. 
It's an impressive name. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Next up, what DNA is used to fill in missing dinosaur genomes? Wow. Fast. <laughs> okay, bonus for tree frogs. I didn't know it was tree. I thought it, I didn't know it was frog specific. So yes, it is frogs. So I'm gonna flip a coin, and then we have in the storyline how many years have passed between the events in the original Jurassic Park and our first glimpse of Jurassic World. Good questions, Amanda. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. I thought they were going to be too elementary based on how, how deep the nerddom goes. Uh, yes. <laughs> and finally, I'm hoping this one might be a little bit trickier just because there's multiple parts. In Jurassic World, we are introduced to the Raptor Squad. What are their names? I know, I know. <laughs> oh. Oh, wow, look at that. Boom. Nice, Lost. yes, blue. And in the Holy order I have them listed too, blue, Charlie, Echo, and Delta. Steven, it's, uh, it's, you had beta in there. That is very tempting to include, but it was Echo. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, Who, Glenn, can you, can you say their genetic makeup? <laughs> oh, other than Glenn, damn. <laughs> All right, Me. those are my questions. <laughs> We will make sure to get these shipped out to you. I'll be in touch via email um, and get these little goodie bags out your way. Yeah, I don't have that one, Mariano. I did not get the <laughs> Raptors squad for this. Um, yeah, do they have nice Triceratops? I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember them either. <laughs> it's like yeah, Ghost is one or something. Yeah. I figured Chris would ask a question about the Raptors uh, being, you know, had a Jurassic Out post. So that, that makes sense. So hi to Chris. So th this is really great to see. Awesome. I am so stoked. Thank you all. Yeah, it's Ghost Red Panther. Those sound right to me. I'll take it. Um, thank <laughs> you all for showing up and spending time with us again to celebrate this amazing book. Um, so much love and clearly passion went into this project. Thank you to my team at Insight for putting this together. Um, I always get the joy of taking the finished product and bringing it to the world. So um, I'm so grateful to have had such a warm reception. Um, we will be sending this recording out um, in an email to all of you and all the registrants. And you're welcome to share it with whomever you think will get a kick out of this. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Glenn, Derek, James, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is fantastic. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you well, also thank for you, organize, Amanda. organizing. Derek, thank you for hosting. You've been brilliant. And Glenn, thank you for being awesome, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, and James, James, thank you for writing just two amazing books. Derek, your passion is just so obvious. And Amanda, thank you so much for organizing all this. And I hope everyone gets out there and reads that book because it just there's things in there that I hadn't heard about or read about. And I was just pouring over every page like a little kid. So it was awesome. <laughs> well, thank you all for having me. It was really fun. It was great. <laughs> awesome.